Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the previous two lectures, I motivated and introduced to you Poincaré mappings. Now, Poincaré mappings are a way of transferring a complex high dimensional continuous time dynamical system into a discrete iterative process. Now, what I would like to do in this lecture and the ones that follow it are talk about these discrete iterative processes, so-called mappings. And in particular, I'm going to start small, just like how I started with continuous time systems. I'm going to start with one dimensional mappings. Okay. And it turns out that unlike one dimensional flows, those, you know, flow on the line, flow in the circle where nothing really all that interesting happens. All it takes is a one dimensional mapping to get chaos and really, really, really complicated uh, dynamics. And this comes from the fact that you can kind of jump anywhere around. Continuous time systems, they're forced to be continuous in time. You can't really deviate that much. So I want to show you something really, really cool as we talk through these, these mappings. And let's start from the basics. I'm always going to talk about iterative processes that look like this. Okay, so you have a current state, it goes into a function, and you get the next state. I'm always going to assume that I have a real valued function that is smooth, okay? I'm going to have to take some derivatives. So, of course, I don't want to have to worry about, you know, uh, mathematical theory that says, you know, when I can and can't take derivatives. So let's assume that derivatives can always be taken. Well, this thing will generate an orbit. So we can talk about an orbit. Well, that is an initial condition. Condition x naught, which leads to a sequence, which I will say is xn, which n goes from 0 to infinity. And of course, each xn is given by its value underneath this mapping, right? So where xn plus 1 is equal to f of xn, for all n greater than or equal to zero, or alternatively, I could also write this. Xn is equal to f, and it looks like it's to the power of n. Now what this means is this is the composition of f with itself. So f of f of, of f x zero, right? So if I want to get to x one, I apply f. If I want to get to x2, I apply f again, so f of f of x0. In this way, you can see that everything is generated by the initial condition. And of course, as we've already seen, I'm going to be interested in fixed points. Now, we've already seen this with Poincaré mappings, but of course, a fixed point is going to be a point x star such that f of x star is equal to x star. Remember, in the Poincaré mapping context, this would correspond to a limit cycle intersecting or a closed orbit intersecting with the Poincaré section. Here again, we're sort of lifting ourselves in the abstract. And we're just going to think about these things as discrete iterative processes. And of course, if I've got a fixed point, then I've got stability too. And again, this is where our flow k multipliers come in from the previous uh, set a uh, video. So I'm going to set xn equal to, let's say, x star plus eta n, my typical sort of deviation variable, eta n. And when I put this into my dynamical system, this is telling me that x star plus eta n plus one. So the next deviation is given by x star plus eta n. And I get, again, through Taylor, it's always Taylor, f prime of x star, eta n plus order eta n squared. And since x star is equal to f of x star, these two terms will cancel each other. And so I get a linearized dynamical system here. You know, we've seen this, we saw it in the previous video, but again, we're just doing it in a simple setting so you can see how all of this fits together. 
So you get a linearized map. And this linearized map is the next deviation a to n plus 1. This is equal to uh, f prime of x star times a to n. And so in this case, I have my Floquet multiplier. f prime of x star is the Floquet multiplier. So sometimes we just call it a multiplier whenever we're not talking about Poincaré sections. And so we can get stability whenever this thing is smaller than one, right? Because the general solution here, so this implies that eta n is equal to f prime of x star all to the power of n times the initial condition. And so this thing is going to go to zero if and only if f prime of x star is smaller than one. So we could say that we get linear stability Well, we have linear stability if f prime of x star is smaller than 1. And we could also turn that on its head, and we could say that we have instability. So linear instability if that thing is bigger than 1. Again, this is just the same as what we did with flow k multipliers, exactly the same process, it's just in 1D. Actually, this fits into the perspective of the Poincaré map example we did. And of course, you have got a marginal case whenever that thing is equal to plus or minus 1, right? Because this thing will just oscillate, or say as a constant sequence. So, I went quickly through it, but hopefully it's mostly review, right? This is, this is you know, based on the Poincaré map, and really it's a lot of the same processes we've been looking at when it comes to dynamical systems. But there is a fundamental difference here, right? Stability properties in discrete time are very different than stability properties in continuous time, and this usually causes a huge headache, including for me. I mix, mix it up all the time. You have to be very, very careful in this case, stability means that you're, you are between minus 1 and plus 1, okay, for your multiplier. Let's look at some examples because this is potentially an area for things being very messed up. So, for example, if I gave you a test, I could say find the fixed points of this. And maybe if you haven't been paying attention, you're going to say xn is equal to 0, right? Well xn equal to 0 is a fixed point, but not probably for the reason that you immediately think it is, because maybe you're just trying to set the right-hand side equal to 0. No. Remember, fixed points are solutions to this equation. So you solve x star equal to x star squared, which gives you two solutions. So maybe you guessed the first one right for the wrong reasons, but you probably missed the second one at 1. And so, now we have two fixed points here. We can analyze their stability. So let's look at the multipliers associated with these. So the multipliers. Well, let's look at, so if I call this thing f of xn, if I say f prime of, say, 0, this is equal to 0. Okay. So, again, if you were looking at this in the continuous time setting, you would say, I can't determine stability from this. But that's because you're looking at it the wrong way. This is in the discrete time setting. Stability is when you're between minus 1 and 1. So, since 0 is between minus 1 and 1, this tells us that the fixed point at 0 is stable. Similarly, f prime of 1, this is equal to 2, which since it's outside of the interval minus 1 to 1, gives us that this point is unstable. Okay, 
So it's probably a big change and it's going to come with some growing pains as well, right? It's, it's a new perspective and it's gonna take you some time to sort of get your hands around this. And that's why I wanted to do a little bit of a unit about these discrete time systems. Now, there's a really good way that we've already actually seen in this class to visualize these one dimensional systems. And that's through what's called a cobweb diagram. So let's look at another example. Let's do xn plus 1 is equal to sine of xn. Okay, so I know that there's at least one fixed point to this thing, right? So the fixed points are going to solve x star equal to sine of x star. And like I said, there's one solution for sure, which is x star equal to 0. You can actually find out that there are no other solutions to this, uh, but that's okay. For now, we've got one fixed point. And also, if we take the right-hand side to be f, then f prime of zero is cos of zero, which is equal to one. That's a bit of a problem, right? Because that is on the boundary between stable and unstable. It doesn't tell us if we have stability. So this is where the sketching comes in, the so-called cobweb diagrams, okay? So how do you do this? Cobweb diagram comes in two pieces. You start by sketching the right-hand side of the, uh, of the discrete time dynamical system, so this function f. So let's do that. Honestly, that's probably the best sine curve I've ever drawn. And I know it's not great, but that's okay. So here's my x-axis. And then on top of that, so this is y equal to sine of x. So here's my y-axis. On top of that, I'm going to draw the curve y equal to x. Okay, so here it is, y equal to x. And we saw this with the Poincaré map video. We can actually plot the trajectory of these things and we can visualize stability and instability in the same way that we have things like a flow in the circle or a flow in the line or a phase line diagram. So for example, let's imagine we start at x naught equal to pi over 2. Okay, well then that tells me that if I trace this up, I get x1 right here. Right, so here's x1. Now the question is, this is x1. Now I know this, x1 is equal to one, but that means that I gotta go back down onto the, y, onto the x axis and find it. But the reason that I have this y equal to x here is because whatever's on the x axis on this line is the same as what's on the y axis. So I could just trace this over. And now this line right here is one. But that means that I don't need to come up, I can just come down from this line. And here's x2. I don't know what x2 is, it's sine of one, it's a number that I cannot compute in my head, it doesn't matter. But then I do the same thing, over, vertical. There's x3, over, vertical. There's x4. And you can see my picture is getting more and more cramped, but it looks like my solutions are converging into the fixed point at x equal to zero. And you can do this all over the place. Maybe I could, uh, well, if I do it, let's say right here, let's do this as my x zero instead. I come down to the curve to get x one. I go over to y equal to x. In this case, I go up to get x2, I go over, I go up, right? It's just over and up, or, or vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal. Vertical goes to the curve of the right-hand side, horizontal goes to the y equal to x line. And again, this is called a cobweb diagram. You might be able to see why. It kind of looks like it's you know building a cobweb, same way a spider would sort of go around and around and sort of thread 
its web. And it allows us to visualize this sort of ticky-tacking of these discrete dynamical systems, their motion through these discrete iterates. Now look at these things take huge jumps, right? It's not the same as what we see in continuous time systems. But nonetheless, we still have a visual way, a geometrical way of representing these things. If you ever want to have fun, maybe you're bored sitting somewhere and you've got a scrap of paper and a pencil, draw a random curve and sketch the, the uh, cobweb diagram for it. See how complicated it is or see if it's super easy, right? In this case, everything converges into zero and that's easy. But things can get very, very complicated very quickly. Let's look at another example. So instead of sine x n plus one, let's do cosine. Right? That's another function I know. I know how to plot it. Let's actually, you know, let's see what the cobweb diagram looks like here. So in this case, I'm going to get something that might look like this. I'm only going to draw it within one period because it doesn't really matter what it looks like outside of one period. And here's y equal to x. Here's y equal to cos x. Here's x. Here's y. And let's just start somewhere somewhat random. Let's start here for x0. Okay, so again, vertical up to the curve. There's x1 over to y equal to x, vertical up to the curve, there's x2, so maybe I'll plot them here for you, over to y equal to x, vertical, there's x3, horizontal, vertical, that's x4, so on and so forth. And if you do this right, it should look like it's spiraling in, right? You can kind of see it with my picture. Now, if you want to, the fixed point here is, you know, there's a unique fixed point. It's about, let's say, 0.739-ish. You know, there's, there's lots of decimals in there, but it doesn't matter. That's just solving x is equal to cos of x. You could do that with, you know, a standard Newton iteration or just a computer, you know, whatever you want to do. But the interesting thing here is that you spiral, you jump over, right? X3 is bigger than the fixed point. X3 is over here, and then X4 is over here, and then X5 is over here, and you jump back and forth. And that comes from the fact that in this case, sine of this value, so if you do the linearization, F prime of X star is equal to uh, sorry, minus sine, pardon me, minus sine of 0 0.739, blah, 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 which is less than zero, but bigger than minus one. So you still have stability, but you have a negative number. And think about what that means. My eta n plus one was multiplied by f prime of x star at each iteration, that means that I'm flipping sides of x star. When this multiplier is negative, I get this tic-tacking back and forth, the flipping, the jumping over the fixed point. And what it looks like in the, in the uh, cobweb diagram is this sort of spiraling in. It really starts to look a lot more like a cobweb. Okay, let's do a longer, more complicated example. All right, let's look at the logistic function. We can't get enough of the logistic function in math. We use it as a simple example in discrete, uh, sorry, in continuous time dynamical systems. We use it as a simple example in discrete dynamical systems. Turns out it has like a lot of what we need. So in this case, I'm going to look at the logistic uh, function. The only thing that I did is I replaced the sort of time derivative that we saw in continuous time with an xn plus 1. So it's a mapping now, but it's the same quadratic right-hand side. And in this case, I'm only thinking about x being between 0 and 1. I would like you to try and figure out why I'm doing that. Try and pick values of x outside of there and see where their iterates go. And I'm also only going to look at r between 0 and 4. So these are big differences between the discrete 
and the continuous functions, right? I could always look at any value of R that's positive and I could always look at any value of X that's positive. Here now I have restrictions. Okay, but assuming that we're willing to accept these restrictions, let's keep going, okay? First thing we do, fixed points, always, right? So fixed points. Well, this is x is equal to rx1 minus x, okay? So I dropped the star, but again, you're just solving a quadratic equation. And it's either you can divide off the x or x is equal to zero, which tells you the fixed points are at zero and one minus one over r. So again, very different. It's not, it doesn't have a carrying capacity in the same way that the continuous time one did, right? So I, again, be very, very, very careful here. But I've got some fixed points. What's next? Stability. So let's go through this stability. Well, in this case, if uh, my f prime of x star, so for either x star, is equal to r minus 2r x star, which tells me that f prime of zero is equal to r. Okay, so what does that mean for me? That tells me that x star equals zero is stable. Well, again, r is bigger than zero and it goes up to four. I need this thing to be smaller than one to have stability, so therefore, it's stable for r less than 1. All right, that's interesting. Let's keep going, though. f prime of 1 minus 1 over r. In this case, you're going to get 2 minus r. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. This tells me that x star equal to 1 minus 1 over r is stable for, well, it's only going to be when the absolute value of this thing is smaller than 1. So when 2 minus r in absolute value is smaller than 1, which you can expand this out, right? This is minus 1 is less than 2 minus r, which is less than 1, which tells you that 1 is less than r, which is less than 3. So, take a look at this. One of the fixed points is stable up to one, and then after that, the other one takes over, but it's only stable up to three. Now, what I also want you to notice is that when r is equal to one, these two fixed points collide. So, let's take note of something that we've already seen here. There is a collision of fixed points where they exchange stability. Where have we seen that? That's a transcritical bifurcation. It's the same process. Those same bifurcations take place in these discrete time systems and they have the same meaning, okay? So I get a transcritical bifurcation at r equal to one where I get this non-trivial steady state or fixed point becomes stable. But it changes at r equal to 3. I lose stability at r equal to 3. So what happens? Okay, so let's ask ourselves this. What happens at r equal to 3? Well, here's what I want you to notice. First of all, f prime of 1 minus 1 over r is equal to, okay, so again, it's 2 minus r, and at r equal to 3, then this gives me that f prime of 1 minus 1 over r is equal to minus 1. Okay, so we destabilize by crossing out of the minus 1 to 1 interval, going backwards through the negative values. Now we also saw that when this thing is stable and this is negative, we spiral in. Now if you choose a value of r that's slightly larger, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, this becomes 
smaller than minus one, but still negative. And so I'll spiral out. Now, what does this kind of look like? I went from spiraling in, then I cross r equal to three, I'm spiraling out. It looks a lot like a hop bifurcation, right? Remember, spiral in, spiral out. Then you have something to catch you. Now, what actually happens here, that thing that catches you, is like a discrete version of a Hopf bifurcation, and it's actually what's called a two-cycle. So, a two-cycle emerges. So, what is a two-cycle? A two-cycle are two points that flip back and forth under F. So, this is two points, let's call them P and Q, such that F of P is equal to Q, and F of Q is equal to P. It's two points that flip back and forth between each other. So if you think about what their orbit looks like, if I start with the initial condition P, my orbit goes P, Q, P, Q, P, Q, P, Q. If I start with initial condition Q, it goes Q, P, Q, P, Q, P, Q, P. So it's a two cycle. It's cycling between two values. And so the question is, how do, you, how do I know that this happens? How do I find this? Well, I've got equations that I can solve. So to find these, I can set up these equations. And first of all, Q is equal to F of P. This means Q is equal to R times P times 1 minus P. And P is equal to F of Q means that P is equal to R times Q times 1 minus Q. Or, equivalently, so this is going to be painful, right? That's two nonlinear equations. But I also know that I could take F squared of P, which is just F of F of P, which is F of Q, which is P. So, i.e., P and Q are fixed points of the second iterate map. I'm going to call it F2, right? So remember I introduced this, this notation that we have for discrete dynamical systems. It's not F squared. It is the composition of F with itself. So actually, it becomes a fixed point problem, but it becomes a fixed point problem for the second iterate map now. So let's do this. Let's actually solve it. Solving this, I'm going to get second iterate of x minus x, uh, which is going to be equal to, I actually did this all for you. Uh, so it's going to be really, really ugly. But who cares? You can use a symbolic manipulator if you want. You're going to solve this quartic system equal to zero. Okay. Now, the important part is there's already some solutions here. Ah, sorry. I forgot a minus x on the end here. There's already a few solutions. There's two roots that I already know to this thing. And those two roots are the fixed points that I already identified because their sequence is just 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so by definition, that sequence also is a two cycle, right? It repeats every two units. Actually, it repeats every one unit, but that's okay. It's still going to be a fixed point of the second iterate map. So this has two roots at x equal to 0 and 1 minus 1 over r. That means that there's only, it's a quartic equation, there's only the possibility for two other roots. So this implies that p and q, again, you can use a symbolic calculator here, maybe Wolfram, you know, whatever your preferred computational method for solving these are. But it's going to be a quadratic formula. You get r plus 1 plus or minus the square root of r minus 3 r plus 1, all divided by 2r. 
Okay. So, take a look at these things. This only exists, only exists for r greater than or equal to 3. That's interesting, right? Because the point where this thing exists is exactly where this thing destabilizes. Furthermore, if I put in r equal to 3 here, so the square root disappears, p and q correspond to the same number, I get 4 divided by 6, right? So I get 2 thirds. Now 1 minus 1 over r, that's also 2 thirds. So look what happens. It's another bifurcation. In this case, this bifurcation is a flip bifurcation or a period doubling bifurcation. And so what happens is that when this fixed point destabilizes, when its, when its multiplier goes through minus one, that transition from spiraling in to spiraling out causes the breaking off of the orbit and it causes the, the creation of a two cycle to form. And so here I have P and Q, and for every R larger than three, I have a two cycle that is given by this equation. So if I put P in, I get Q into the map. And if I put Q in, I get P. And then if I put P back in, I get a Q. And then I put Q back in, I get P. And I flip back and forth between two numbers. So you can see this is like a boiling, right, that's happening. As R gets close to three, that spiraling in eventually just breaks and it spirals out. And what happens is that breaking causes a two cycle to form. It's really, really, really cool. We can even go further. We can ask ourselves, what's the stability of the two cycle? Now, how do you do this? So we could say two cycle stability. Well, the way we do this is just by looking at the stability of the fixed points of the second iterate map. So recall, P and Q are fixed points of the second iterate map. So that means that I could just look at the multiplier of the second iterate map. So I could say, let's say, uh, the derivative of the second iterate map. So this would be f of f of x evaluated at x equal to, say, p. It doesn't really matter which one you evaluate at, but let's actually do this, okay? So it's a chain rule application here. So I would get f prime of f of p and then times f prime of p. But f of p is equal to q, so I really get f prime of q times f prime of p. So if I would have used q instead of p, I would just flip the order. But multiplication is commutative in, in mathematics, so we're okay, right? So what this shows you is that the stability of two cycles is really just these multipliers of each element on the two cycle. Or you could have a three cycle and you just take the derivative and evaluate it at each element and then multiply them all together to get your multiplier. You could have a 10 cycle, do the same thing, right? Just a bunch of derivatives. It's only a first derivative at every single step and it's just evaluated at each point on the cycle. So in our case, uh, you can actually compute this. So I'm going to just leave it for you to have a little bit of uh, fun here, but f prime of q, f prime of p, it just takes a little bit of symbolic manipulation. You can do it. 4 plus 2r minus r squared. And so we would like, you know, st we have stability when, well, when minus 1 is less than f prime of q times f prime of p is less than 1 which is the same as minus one is less than four plus two r minus r squared, which is less than one, which in this case gives you, so uh, you can actually figure this out, right? This is a quadratic, you might have to graph it, find some roots, that's fine, there's no big deal here. But essentially you get when three is less than r, which is less than one 
plus the square root of 6. So there's my 3 again. And now I've got an upper bound. So again, th this thing doesn't stay stable forever. It actually destabilizes again. So let's summarize with a bifurcation diagram what's going on. So we've done bifurcation diagrams before. We've seen that we plot the parameter on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we plot the value of the fixed point. So I'm going to say x star. Now, in our case, we have more than just fixed points. We have, um, we have limit cycles. Or sorry, we have two cycles as well. But let's start with this at 0 up to r equal to 1. We have a stable fixed point, which becomes unstable afterwards. Then, at 1, we have a transcritical bifurcation where we give birth to the other fixed point at 1 minus 1 over r. All right? So if you want to, you can write T for transcritical bifurcation taking place here. And there's a point, let's say at 3, where this thing becomes unstable. Then we have a 2 cycle. Now, 2 cycles are hard to draw on these diagrams. Typically, the way we draw them is we draw both P and Q together. Okay, So what that would look like is this. So we draw both branches of this thing, and we know that they cease to be stable after about, uh, well, after exactly 1 plus the square root of 6. Okay? So again, here I've got a period doubling or a flip bifurcation. That's when the, eigen, or the multiplier goes through minus 1. But now look at what happens here. 1 plus the square root of 6, what happens next? Well, it turns out that my 2 cycle undergoes another period doubling bifurcation where you get now a 4 cycle. So the 2 cycle doubles. And that thing only exists for so long before it becomes unstable as well. So you have a period doubling here, and then you get another period doubling, period doubling, period doubling. And it turns out that that fourth cycle destabilizes into an 8 cycle, and then the 8 cycle into a 16 cycle, and the 16 into a 32, the 32 into 64. And what happens is these things, the stability windows get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, and it all happens before r equal to 4. And you have an infinite sequence of period doubling bifurcations until you, you have doubled so much until you have sort of infinitely many unsta unstable periodic or unstable cycles. And that infinitely many unstable cycles is a hallmark of chaos. So if you take uh, R somewhere around like 3.6 or something like that, or maybe a little bit larger, you've got all of those periodic orbits in there and you've got a, a completely chaotic system, right? You've got all of these, these two cycles, four cycles, eight cycles, 16 cycles, 32 cycles. They all are in there, but they're all unstable. You can find them just using the same methods. It becomes more tedious, but you can still do it. And they're all in there. They're all unstable, but you have chaos. You're always being pushed and pulled by all of these unstable trajectories. You get close to one, they say, get away, go, go over there. And you get close to another one, it says, get away, go over there. And you just keep getting pinballed around by all of these unstable cycles. Now, when we come back in the next video, we're going to look at Lyapunov exponents, the classical way to quantify the typical way that we describe a chaotic system, the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So, when we come back, we'll look at what a Lyapunov exponent is and how it helps us to understand chaotic systems. I'll see you in the next lecture, everybody.